Hi, welcome back to Joe Blogs. This video is the next in a series looking at the financial implications of Russia's invasion of Ukraine on the global economy. And in today's episode, I want to talk about inflation. If you follow the channel, you'll know that I regularly talk about prices around the world, and obviously we're seeing high rates globally. But in today's episode, for the first time, I'd like to talk about inflation in China. Now, over the course of the last 12 months or so, we haven't really focused in on inflation being an issue in China. It's been at relatively low rates, particularly when you compare it to some of the G20 countries. But the figures for September have now been released and they show that inflation hit a 29 month high in China. And there are concerns that we're now starting to see the same sort of price increases that we've seen all across the world starting to hit China. And this is coming at a time when China is experiencing problems with regards to growth, and so it's a major issue for the economy. So in today's episode, we'll have a look at the data that's come out of China. We'll dig down into the detail as to what's actually driving the increase in inflation and how that's affecting the population of China. We'll then go on to have a look at the latest rates of inflation from the rest of the G20, what's been happening over the course of the last month. As you'll know if you follow the channel, a lot of countries have been increasing their interest rates in order to try to bring inflation back down. So we'll see whether or not that strategy is working. And then finally today, I'll wrap up with my summary. So what I think the implications of the ongoing problem with inflation is for the global economy and what the impact of the continuation of the war in Ukraine is. So before we get started on all of that, if I could ask you to give me a thumbs up at some point during this video, if you're enjoying the content, please subscribe if you haven't done so already. Don't forget, I always include chapters in these videos, so if you don't have time to watch the entire thing, you can pick and choose what you'd like to see. And if you'd like to support the channel, please have a look below where you'll find links to YouTube Super Thanks and membership, as well as Buy Me A Coffee, Patreon, and Amazon shopping links. So once again, I'd just like to say thank you so much to everyone that has contributed to the channel. If you've bought me a coffee or a Super Thanks, or joined as a member of YouTube or Patreon, or used the Amazon shopping links, I really appreciate it. It really does help me, gives me that boost. It's quite tricky making these videos on a such a regular basis, but it's nice to know that everybody appreciates them and that you're still enjoying the content. China has announced that inflation in September hit 2.8%, which is the highest level seen for 29 months. And the main driver behind price increases was the movement in food costs. Food prices in the 12 months to September were up 8.8%, which is a massive increase from the 6.1% 12 month position we saw in August. But this table shows where the main movements in food prices occurred during September. And you can see that the biggest single contributor was the price of pork, which increased by 36%. Now China is the world's biggest consumer of pork. It's the most popular meat substance in the country. And the industry has been hit by a number of problems. Firstly, the global increase in livestock feed prices as a direct result of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Secondly, there's been a large increase in demand for pork in China. The COVID-19 lockdowns that have been happening for the last 18 months and are still ongoing in China are forcing a lot more people to stay at home. They're cooking more from home and therefore they're buying more pork. And there's also been some problems with regards to the disease in the country. So a combination of all of these factors has meant that the price of pork has increased dramatically. And this is having a really big weighted impact on the overall inflation in China. But as we can see from this table, it's not just pork that's driving higher food prices. The cost of fresh fruit is up almost 18% and fresh vegetables are up by more than 12%. And as you can see, the price of cooking oil in China is up by 8.3%. And this is directly related to what's going on in Ukraine. As you'll be aware if you follow the channel, Ukraine and Russia are two of the largest exporters of sunflower seeds. And those sunflower seeds are used to make sunflower oil. So we've got a global shortage of sunflower oil right now. That's meant that everybody's had to move to other forms of oil. And so the price of all cooking oil around the world has risen dramatically over the course of the last seven months. This chart shows the movement in consumer prices and food prices over the last 18 months. Consumer prices are shown on the red line and food prices are shown by the blue line. And you can see that in line with what's been happening around the rest of the world, since Russia's invasion of Ukraine at the end of February, there has been a marked increase in food prices in China. At the start of 2022, food prices had actually declined in China. But over the last six months, that trend has been reversed. So you can see that the curve is now steeply upwards. And when you look at the correlation between food prices and consumer prices, you can see that food prices are dragging the overall inflation up in China. And as I mentioned before on the channel, the problem that you have when you have high rates of food inflation is that it affects all of the poor people disproportionately. 
Poorer members of society spend a much larger percentage of their monthly budget on food. It can be as high as 80 or 90% of all of their income is going on food. So when you've got an 8.8% increase year on year, that puts a lot of pressure on people with lower budgets. Because the poorer members of your society generally don't have a lot of savings, maybe don't even have any. So when you have an 8.8% increase, it often means that they end up buying less food. And that situation can lead to real problems in your society. So we've discussed this a lot on the channel, but the problems with regards to food prices are affecting a lot of countries around the world. And what we're seeing now is that this is starting to become a major problem in China. And whilst the overall level of inflation at 2.8% looks very healthy, and it's actually below the 3% target that the Chinese authorities have set, Food price inflation is a really important factor and you have to look at that in terms of what your people are spending their money on. And if they can't afford to buy as much food as they used to, then that's going to present the 1.4 billion people in China with a major issue. So let's have a look at what's going on right now with regards to the current rates of inflation for the G20 countries, which are the 20 biggest economies in the world. This table shows the latest inflation rates and I've ranked it from highest to lowest. So you can see that right at the top of the shop, not surprisingly, is Turkey. And the rate of inflation for September is now up to 83.45%, which is an increase on the figure that we saw for August. And is still at the highest level of any of the G20, albeit Argentina is making a big effort to try to catch up. Now, just to put everything into perspective, this is the list of the actual highest inflation rates in the world right now. Zimbabwe's number one at 280%, Lebanon number two at 162%, Syria 139%, Sudan 125%, although that figure is quite out of date and could actually be higher now. Venezuela also out of date, but 114% was the most recently released figure. And Turkey is now at number six and Argentina at number seven on this list. And when you look at this list in the context of Turkey and Argentina being two of the biggest economies in the world, it shows the level of crisis that's going on in both countries right now. All of the rest of the countries on this list have major problems right now, either caused as a direct result of war or complete mismanagement of the economy or some sort of collapse. So the fact that Turkey and Argentina are towards the top of this list shows the really deep problems that are going on in both of those economies right now. And while we're on the topic of Turkey, I think it's worth having a quick look at what's been going on with regards to interest rates. And you can see that over the course of the last 12 months, despite the fact that inflation is now up at 80 plus percent, Turkey has been reducing its interest rates. And as I've mentioned a number of times on the channel before, the traditional way of dealing with extremely high inflation is to increase interest rates because that increases the cost of borrowing. It reduces the amount of free cash that everybody has available. Therefore, it discourages spending. You reduce demand and therefore prices should start to come down. That's the traditional theory. Turkey decided around 12 months ago that it didn't believe in that traditional theory and that the way to solve high inflation was to lower interest rates. Now, at the time when they started that policy, inflation was at around 20% in Turkey. Since they've started reducing interest rates, it's gone from 20% to 80%. But President Erdogan has stated that he is going to stick with the policy. They're going to continue reducing interest rates. And it may well be that Turkey manages to get to the top of the world list of inflation if it does carry on with this strategy. Having said that, inflation in Argentina is also out of control. And if we look at what's been happening with the interest rates in Argentina, they have actually been increasing their interest rates and they are at incredibly high levels. So this time last year, interest rates were almost 40%. And over the course of the last 12 months, Argentina have increased its interest rates to the current level of 75%. But as you can see from this chart, those increases in interest rates hasn't really addressed the high levels of inflation. And over the course of the last six months, particularly since the start of the Ukraine war, we have seen a massive jump in inflation in Argentina. Now, if you follow the channel, you'll know that I've mentioned a few times that I am intending to do a full video on Argentina to explain exactly how it's got itself into such a difficult situation. It's still on my list to do. I just haven't found time to do it yet. But 
Jumping back to the list, the country with the next highest rate of inflation at 14.5% is the Netherlands. And the current rate represents a 2.5% increase since August. So that is a big jump in the month. Now, the problem that the Netherlands has is that it's part of the European Union. And it's one of the countries that signed up to the collective interest rate policy. So the Netherlands Central Bank is not in charge of setting interest rates in the country. That's being done by the European Union. And as you'll know if you follow the channel, the rates of increase in Europe have been far lower and slower than the rest of the world. The current rate of interest in Europe is 1.25%, which is a lot less than it is in many of the other countries on this list. And so the Netherlands hasn't really been able to introduce a policy to be able to calm inflation, and it's now getting to runaway levels. And one of the reasons that the Netherlands is at the top of this list is that it's a big importer of oil. The Netherlands operates as a hub. It imports large quantities of oil, and it also exports large quantities. So it's a trader in oil. And because the price of oil has risen dramatically over the course of the last 12 months and is also very volatile, it's feeding through into inflation in the Netherlands. Russia is number four on this list. The official rate of inflation is now quoted as 13.7% which is actually a reduction compared with the rate that was published for August. However, as you'll know if you follow the channel, I'm not 100% convinced that the figures that we're getting out of Russia right now are very reliable. I think these figures don't really reflect what's actually going on with consumer prices in Russia. They've experienced a lot of problems with regards to the sanctions. They're unable to get a lot of products. There are shortages and there are massive price increases in a lot of product areas. So 13.7% actually looks like a relatively low level when you compare it to what's going on in other countries. Inflation in Germany is now running at 10%, which represents a major increase compared with 7.9% for August. And the situation in Germany is similar to what we discussed for the Netherlands. Germany is part of the collective interest rate policy. That interest rate is only at 1.25% right now, and therefore it isn't bringing down demand and it's not bringing back consumer prices. So unfortunately, Germany is suffering because of the collective rate. The United Kingdom is no longer a member of the European Union. However, it actually had its own interest rate setting policy anyway, even when it was in the EU. And inflation in the UK is running at around 10% and remains a major problem for the economy. Now, if you've been following what's been going on in the UK, you'll know that there's been a change of leadership. Liz Truss replaced Boris Johnson. Some new policies were announced with regards to tax cuts. That caused major problems in the financial markets and led to the cost of borrowing for the UK government increasing dramatically. That policy has subsequently been reversed, but there's been a loss of confidence in the financial markets, in the government in the UK. It's likely that we will see more interest rate increases over the course of the next few months and that they could be quite aggressive. So things are starting to get out of control in the UK, and it's likely that we will see inflation staying at or above 10% over the course of the next few months. Inflation in Italy is now at 8.9%, which represents an increase on the figure for August. And once again, Italy is part of the collective interest rate policy in the EU, so is not independently in control of its economic decisions and therefore is unable to bring prices back right now. Inflation in Spain is also at 8.9%. However, that does represent a reduction compared to the situation in August. And it'll be interesting to see whether or not that continues over the course of the next few months or whether this is a short term dip and we see inflation rising again. Inflation in Mexico is now at 8.7%, which is the same level that we saw in August, but still remains high. And the situation is exactly the same in the USA. Inflation in September is 8.2% compared to 8.3% in August. So we're seeing a flat lining, but the level is still significantly higher than the target rate of 2% and remains a major problem in the USA. And so it's very likely that we will see continued interest rate increases over the course of the next three to six months, it's likely that interest rates will get higher and higher. And that's going to put a lot of pressure on people who've taken on debt over the course of the last 18 months. Since the COVID pandemic, we have seen households and companies taking on a lot of debt to be able to get through that difficult period. And the problem we've got now is that the price of all of those loans is going up. And that's going to reduce the amount of income that individuals and companies have. And so that will reduce spending. So it probably will bring inflation down at some point in the longer term. 
But the issue that we have in front of us is that the reduction in the spending is likely to lead to a reduction in GDP and potentially a contraction in the economy and a probable recession. Inflation in South Africa is now at 7.6%. Singapore, it's at 75 And India, we're at 74 Now, the situation for all three of those countries has stabilised over the course of the last month or so. But the bottom line here is that 7.5% inflation is still incredibly high and is much higher than central banks are targeting for all of these countries. So everybody is still being impacted by what's going on in Ukraine. The higher prices we're seeing in terms of oil and commodities and food are still feeding through into all of these economies. And the bottom line is that everybody is going to be increasing interest rates and it's going to reduce growth. Inflation in Brazil and Canada is now down to around 7%, which does represent a reduction month on month. So there is some progress, but again, it's still too high. Now, Australia doesn't release inflation on a monthly basis. So the last figure we have here is for the quarter ended June. You can see that the last figure was 6.1%, which represented a significant increase on the 5.1% reported previously. Inflation is currently around 6% in Indonesia, which is a big increase on 4.7% for the previous period. France has got its inflation down to 5.6% versus 5.9%. So it's actually doing okay, even though it's in the collective interest rate policy. Switzerland's at 3.3%, Saudi Arabia 3.1%, Japan 3%, and China is the bottom of the G20 list with only 2.8%. But as we just discussed, the trend in China is increasing. It's increased over the last six months. But when you look at the detail, the problem that China has is that food inflation is starting to get out of control. So what's the summary and conclusion today? Well, I wanted to post this video because although inflation is really boring and we've all heard the story a million times before, unfortunately, it's still a major problem. It hasn't gone away. And the Ukraine war has really added to the problem. At the start of 2022, we had high rates of inflation in a number of countries around the world predominantly as a result of the COVID pandemic when everything was closed down and then we had this really big bounce back. Everybody came back out and wanted to do things so there was a really big increase in demand for a lot of products and services and a lot of companies were really not ready for that increase in demand because we'd mothballed a lot of factories, we'd shut down production, we'd released staff so we didn't have all of the people in place. Nobody was really ready to fire up all of the output. And so we had a differential between supply and demand, which pushed prices up. And that's the situation that we came into at the start of this year. And everybody was focused on bringing inflation back down under control. It was likely that we were going to see a measured and slow increase in interest rates in order to get back on an even keel. But Russia's invasion of Ukraine really threw a massive spanner in the works. It caused the price of oil and food and commodities to go up dramatically. And we haven't really shaken that off. Because the war is still going on, we've still got those problems. We've still got changes in the global supply chain that are feeding through. Because of the sanctions, nobody wants to take Russian oil and gas. And we're starting to see massive reductions in those purchases. And unfortunately, all of Europe is having to pay more for its alternative supplies. So LNG costs a lot more than natural gas. Oil prices have gone up. So all of this is feeding through into the global economy. So that's why inflation has stayed high. And the only tool that central banks have to address this is interest rates. So they've started increasing interest rates, but it hasn't really had the desired impact. It hasn't brought inflation back under control quickly enough. So over the course of the next six to 12 months, it's likely that we will see more interest rate increases and they are starting to get bigger and they're starting to get more frequent. And that's going to feed through into everybody's budget because these changes take time to hit home. If you've got a mortgage, you'll get a notification from your mortgage company that your interest rate has gone up and therefore your monthly payment has increased. But you don't really appreciate that until you see that debit hitting your checking account. When you see that money going out, you suddenly realize you've actually got less money to spend. And before you've had time to adjust to that new budget, you get another letter through from your mortgage company saying there's another change to interest rates. Your mortgage payment has gone up even more and this is the new amount. So everybody's taking time to really adjust to what's going on right now. And because we've seen some really big movements in interest rates happening quickly, it's likely that over the course of the next three to six months, we will see a big contraction in consumer spending 
And that's going to start hurting the economies of all of these countries. So that's the reason that I wanted to post another video on inflation, because it's at the heart of the problems for the global economy right now. High prices mean that governments have to take some action. The only action that they have available to them is to increase the cost of borrowing. That is going to hurt all of the people with debt and all of the companies with debt. And from where we're sitting right now, it's likely that these interest rate increases will drive a lot of economies into recession over the course of the next three to six months. And obviously that's bad news for the global economy because we're all interconnected. So if one country goes into recession, it has an impact because that country buys goods from other countries. If it's going into recession, it will buy less goods. That means that other countries will sell less, therefore their GDP will go down and it has this knock-on impact. So before you know it, one country going into recession can multiply and you've got a whole continent in recession and then you may have the whole globe in recession. And if you've been following the channel, you'll know that I've posted other videos talking about other risks to the economy. So it's not just about inflation and prices. It's about shortages. It's about what's going on with regards to clever financial instruments that a variety of financial institutions have put together. There is a real risk that we could see a massive global recession kicking in in early 2023 as a direct result of what's going on in Ukraine. And the other problem that we've got is that the Ukraine war hasn't finished. It's likely that it's going to run on for at least the rest of 2022 and possibly well into 2023 and beyond. And if that happens, then it's going to cause more problems and it's going to mean that the recession that we do get is going to be deeper and longer than we're all hoping for. So hopefully you've enjoyed today's episode. You found it interesting, educational and thought-provoking. If you've liked what I've said, then please give me a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't done so already.